Hi, this is Alvin, the CEO of Dr. Wealth. With the rise of China, I think a lot of investors are looking at investing in China stocks, but it is not easy to invest in a foreign country if you do not really understand what are the available investments out there. So some of you might not want to pick individual Chinese stocks and buying an ETF would be the easiest way to get the exposure without having the trouble to go through the analysis of all those stocks. So today I'm going to share with you what are the best China ETFs in 2022. And uh, there are a lot of ETFs even just for China uh, alone. And it is important to know what you're getting into and what kind of exposure you're looking at. And especially China ETFs are more complicated than the US one. Um, later I'll explain to you why I think so. First of all, disclaimer, pause and read if you need to. Okay, this is the reason why I say that Chinese securities or Chinese ETFs may be more complicated as compared to the US ETFs. The reason is because most of the US companies are listed in the US and it doesn't matter um, uh, which ETFs you buy, most of them would have a good coverage that will uh, include most of the popular or even the most crucial critical companies in the US. But this is not the case for China because Chinese companies are listed all over the globe. It can be the US ADRs, it can be the A shares that are listed in Shanghai and Shenzhen, or it can be H shares in Hong Kong. And these are just the main markets. And we haven't talked about China stocks listed in Malaysia, in Singapore, and even Australia, all over the place. Right? China securities or Chinese stocks, for the matter, are uh, more internationally uh, listed as compared to just the US stocks listing in the US markets. So I do think that one of the reasons is that the Chinese companies want more international exposure and likely they have to go overseas because um, A shares originally before I think 21.4, they were not available for foreign investors. So if a Chinese company want to list uh, to get foreign investments they need to list in other countries. So I do think that that was one of the chief reasons that caused this uh, internationalization or globalization of Chinese securities listed everywhere around the globe, right? So the four main markets that we're talking about are the US, okay, uh, China A shares that are listed in Shanghai and Shenzhen, and then your A shares in Hong Kong. Okay, so these are the four main markets which the best Chinese companies are found. Let's talk about the US ADR. There's about 163 of them and 92 are the common stocks. That means they are not via the depository receipt system and they're listed either in the NYSE or NASDAQ board. And of course, there's one concern that uh, the delisting of all these securities are possible, right? But um, at this point in time, nothing concrete has been done yet. That There's only just a blacklist of, uh, not say a blacklist, okay, a list of uh, securities that the SEC has identified as possible delisting candidates. But of course, there are discussion going on at the point of uh, this recording and we don't know the outcome yet, right? But there are over 200 securities, Chinese securities listed in the US. And then let's look at the A shares. This would be the bulk of the securities, Chinese securities uh, that you can invest in. There are 1,480 of them and they are either listed in Shanghai or Shenzhen. Okay, And they must be included under the Stock Connect program via Hong Kong. Otherwise, foreign investors will not be able to buy the A shares. So there are more than 1,480 shares uh, in is under Shanghai and Shenzhen, right? There's probably about 4,500, okay, about there. So it's about a third that is available for foreign investors, okay? And then in Hong Kong, there are 297 H shares that are listed over there. There are more Chinese companies, um, some are like red chips, the smaller ones, okay? But H shares are the more uh, prominent Chinese companies that are listed in Hong Kong. Okay, so altogether, if you sum it up, you get to about 2,000 shares that foreign investors can look at when you want to invest in Chinese securities. Right? So with this different kind of uh, uh, geography, how then do we know which ETFs would be able to be more comprehensive in tracking all these Chinese securities? So these are the famous indices uh, when it comes to tracking Chinese companies. So I want to go through a few, uh, a handful of them so that you know which one gets what kind of coverage, right? So choosing the right index is very important, okay? Unlike the US, as I mentioned, most of the US companies are listed in the US and you just buy a US listed ETF, you will get a coverage pretty much there. But this is different for China. So let's say you choose China A50. It's made out of 50 shares, uh, but they are 
as this letter suggests, A shares. Okay, so it's only limited to A shares. That means you only get Shanghai and Shenzhen um, listings and not those that are in US like Alibaba or Hong Kong, uh, Tencent, for example. So you will not invest in those, but you only exclusively invest in A shares. So now you start to see the problem. And this CSI 300 is made up of 300 shares. Same thing, it is only limited to the A shares. Okay, so that is another challenge, right? Even though the numbers have expanded by six times compared to the A50, it is still within the A shares. Uh, SSE 100 is even narrower. This is only in Shanghai, okay, not even in Shenzhen. And likewise for Shenzhen, component index is only in Shenzhen and there's none from uh, Shanghai or any other where uh, any other place like US or uh, Hong Kong. And HSCE ID is a China Enterprise Index, Hang Seng China Enterprise Index. This is only for stocks, Chinese stocks that are listed in Hong Kong. Okay, that means it doesn't include the HS in this case. And likewise for HS tech, it's even narrower. It's the tech, Chinese tech companies listed in Hong Kong. Okay, so you can see that the indices can give you a very different kind of exposure. Right? So make sure you really choose the right one. And I want to share with you the best, best, most comprehensive China index would be MSCI China because it includes your ADRs that are listed in the US, it includes your H shares that are listed in Hong Kong, and it includes your A share that are in Shanghai and Shenzhen. So this is one index that will give you the most comprehensive coverage compared to any other indices out there. Okay, FTSE China is close enough as well. Uh, similarly, just that the uh, ETF that's tracking the uh, FTSE China index, I think one of them has delisted from Hong Kong, so it's no longer available. So I just want to uh, focus on this MSCI China for now. And there are two of them. MSCI China ETF that's listed in the US, and then there's this iShares Core MSCI China ETF that's listed in Hong Kong. Okay, relatively... The Hong Kong one, the Hong Kong listed one is the cheaper version because the expense ratio is just 0.2% as compared to the one that's listed in the US. But the US one is more popular, the fund size is a lot bigger compared to the one in Hong Kong. But, you know, uh, the Hong Kong one is not small either, it's about 1 billion uh, a sing or about sub 1 billion uh, Hong Kong, uh, US dollar, right? So it's about probably about 800 million. So it's not small, it's not that small. Okay, and there are some differences in the number of holdings, uh, but most importantly are the key holdings, right? The top 10 holdings are actually similar. Okay, the top 10 like Tencent, Alibaba, Meituan. So this, uh, this is listed in Hong Kong, this is listed in US, this is listed in Hong Kong, this is, uh, I believe it's either Hong Kong or HS. Okay, they have uh, uh, either one, and this is in Hong Kong, this is again either Hong Kong or HS. Uh, by two is US, net east would be either US or Hong Kong, okay, and then this would be similarly Hong Kong or A shares. They have both, right? The major banks are listed in both Hong Kong and, and uh, the A shares market, so they can choose either one in this ETF. So you can see that they are a lot more comprehensive, they cover uh, all the Chinese companies regardless of where they are listed, right? And I would prefer the iShares Core MSCI China ETF because the differences are minute, but the cost is uh, almost three times cheaper. So it makes a lot more sense to go for the Hong Kong listed ones. And <clears throat> there are other teams that some of the investors are looking at, right? Maybe you like tech companies, okay? And you do see the potential in Chinese tech companies, especially they got whacked down by the share price in the past two years due to the regulations that's ongoing. But... You know, the government is saying that it's coming to an end at the point of this recording. Right? So it is true that there's no fresh kind of regulation that's coming out uh, from the government at this point in time. So uh, it might be true that all this has been stopped and then now the tech companies can look at rebuilding their businesses again. So it might be a good time for you to pick the bottom uh, for these Chinese tech companies. And the, the Chinese tech companies have really grown a lot over the last 10 years. Alibaba and Tencent are the leaders. They are like the exemplary companies to inspire the other entrepreneurs to start businesses in China. So um, they, they have inspired other tech companies like JD.com, Meituan, Pinduoduo, Xiaomi, Niu, uh, Xiaopeng, Li, Li Oto, and many, many others, right? Um, hundreds or if not thousands of them, both public and private. And in fact, Alibaba and Tencent have invested in a lot of all these second generation tech companies in China. And uh, uh, this ecosystem has 
been able to create a lot of successful examples. And even like uh, ByteDance, which is not listed yet, is already one of the largest company in the world, right? They have very successful product and even Sheen, the fashion label, right? Has even overtaken uh, the the very uh, the European brands like your Zara, like your H&M or even a Japanese Uniqlo, right? For the fast fashion kind of category. So uh, this is where the uh, uh, rise of these Chinese tech companies have drawn interest from a lot of investors. So again, if you do want to buy the individual companies, maybe there's just too many for you to consider, too many to analyze, you want to look at some ETFs. What would they be? The favorite would be this iShares Hang Seng Tech ETF. Okay, so this is the most popular one, right? A lot of people who look at the tech companies in China will zoom into this Hang Seng Tech Index. Okay, and it is 34 companies in it and uh, the top 10 has represented 70% portfolio, right? Because Alibaba and Tencent are very big and uh, naturally they will command a very uh, sizable weightage in the portfolio, right? But they are also second generation kind of companies. Uh, Meituan, Xiaomi, as we mentioned just now, quite so is a competitor to um, TikTok or the, the Douyin in China. Then JD.com, NetEase, Semi, uh, Sunny Optical, then the semiconductor manufacturing company and Lenovo, right? So some names are familiar to you, right? Uh, some names may not, but these are the tech companies, Chinese tech companies that are listed in Hong Kong and they are tracked under this Hang Seng Tech Index, okay? And the expense ratio is not, uh, is reasonable at 0.25%. And I want to introduce two other tech ETFs that most investors do not know, okay? <laughs> because um, uh, the names over here are very familiar, right? But when you look at the names in this, the other two ETFs that list down over here, you might find them very, very foreign, okay? Which is supposed to be that case. Um, it is not that they are worse off, right? It is just that they are not so consumer uh, uh, facing and majority of them are probably more B2B, right? Unless you work in industry, otherwise you are unlikely to hear their names before. But why are these two ETFs um, uh, under this, uh, this kind of a suggestion is because there are companies that are listed in A-shares, okay, listed as A-shares, but they are not available for foreign investors. Okay? One of them, they are called the Chinex. Okay? This is a, a sub-board in Shenzhen Stock Exchange. And this Chinex index is to track the fastest growing tech companies in China. They are the smaller ones. They are the not so familiar names to many investors, but they of course have faster growth rate, higher growth rate and more potential for growth. Okay. Um, one of them like this CATL, this is the largest lithium ion battery maker and they supply batteries to car makers like Tesla. Right? So they are very critical in this kind of uh, operations. And you can't buy this, okay? As a foreign investor, you can't buy this stock directly. You have you. The only way to get this kind of exposure is to buy this Chinex ETF, and the expense ratio is on the higher side. Okay, on that, uh, that that's a less desirable kind of number. But you, what you are hoping is that this fast growth, um, cap the, will give you enough capital gain to overcome this high expense ratio, right? So this is only for those who believe in more venture kind of investing. You want to invest in early stages kind of uh, tech startups in China. This Chinex would be the consideration, right? The other one is the Star Market or the Star 50 Index ETF. It is similar to Chinex, just that these shares are listed in Shanghai instead of Shenzhen. So they have rivalry, right? Among the exchanges, Shenzhen and Shanghai, um, they are like uh, enemies, okay, not say enemy, competitors, right? Let's put it that way, a nicer way to do it. And this star market is the answer to Chinex and uh, they have also created ETF to track the performance of this and which means it enables foreign investors to invest in these companies which you cannot invest by their own, on their own, right? Just like the Chinex uh, securities, you can't buy them individually as a foreigner, but you can buy the ETFs and own them uh, via these funds rather than uh, having to, I don't know how you're going to circumvent it, right? Maybe you have to go to China to open a securities account in order for you to buy this or to prove certain... <laughs> Uh, relationship status right with China I, 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 I don't think anyone want to go through the trouble so definitely buying these ETFs will give you access to the star market or the Chinex market and you get to invest in those fast young uh, companies 
more like a venture capitalist kind of uh, approach, right? So those are the two ETFs that I think less investors know about. They are, of course, of higher risk, but also potentially higher returns, okay? It's not for the faint-hearted, right? Otherwise, stick to the Hang Seng Tech Index ETF that will give you the familiar tech names that uh, China has groomed. All right, so these are the three ETFs for tech. Next, I want to talk about uh, some thematic ETFs that may be beneficial um, for the next few years to come. And this is due to the development in China. And in China investing, one thing to take note is that the government have a lot of say, right? Where, which sector they want to develop, which sector they want to invest in. And it is better to invest alongside where these policies are rather than to go against the government because you get all the regulatory issues okay so it's better to go with the government in china this is something different from the u.s right in the u.s you usually just follow the visionary uh, entrepreneurs that's where you put your money in not really the, what the government say but in china it's the opposite right it's not about the entrepreneurs but it's about the government policies where they think that the sectors they want to develop and devote their investments into that is the answer to where uh, investors should look at. So one of the first themes that I want to talk about is clean energy. It is not just the, uh, the West is talking about transition to clean energy. China has al already pledged to be carbon neutral by 2060. And this is very important. The world needs China to be involved in this clean energy transition. The reason is because China is the world's largest com energy consumption country. <laughs> no other country uh, consume more than China. And it is important. That's why that China be bought into this um, clean energy direction. And the good thing is they did. Okay? But they pledged to be carbon neutral only by 2060. Right? So being the factory of the world, they produce a lot of products for the rest of us. Um, they would need to bring down that carbon production so that we can, as a world, as an earth, Okay, we can meet our uh, green targets uh, in time. And China, ma uh, the major source of energy is coal. Okay, so they burn a lot of coal. And coal is one of the dirtiest energy sources that one can use to produce energy or electricity. Right? So uh, this doesn't look like it's going down. Okay? But going forward, it's probably... Uh, they are going to replace it with more wind or solar energy. And the good news is that solar energy have come down in prices a lot. And also thanks to China because they produce a lot of all these solar panels and uh, they could meet uh, the demand uh, as well as lowering the prices at the same time. Right? So improvement in the technology, in the production, in the scale, in the efficiency that enable more uh, of these solar panels to be sold worldwide. Okay, so that is the current state of affair. And that means that there is a clean energy ETF that tracks the Chinese companies. Okay, so it is listed in Hong Kong and the index is this selective China clean energy index. The expense ratio is also on the higher side and the fund size is uh, quite decent, right? 3 billion Hong Kong dollars. So that works out to be about probably 300 million or so of uh, USD. Uh, under fund, funds, the fund size. Okay, holdings is about 20, which is rather concentrated, I would say, for ETF, right? Because usually you see in the hundreds. And the top 10 holdings is about 76.8% of portfolio, right? This is normal because the, the number of uh, stocks are just 20, right? <laughs> 10 is half of the whole portfolio. And occupying majority of the portfolio, uh, weightage is normal, right? Because uh, it's the Pareto principle kind of uh, uh, thing. And you can see that a lot of them are in the solar energy, some nuclear, okay? But you, as when you buy an ETF, you don't want to worry about the holdings, right? Which exactly should be inside of that? Because you're not picking them. You just buy the entire index. You, you uh, have the faith that they will take care of themselves. Because any stocks that do well over the years, they will be uh, up, up, upgraded, they will have more weightage in the portfolio and then the, those that don't do well can get kicked out of the portfolio as well. So you just leave it to the index, right? So don't you worry too much but at least get some sensing what kind of uh, holdings they have and that's good enough, alright? And the second team that I want to share is Semiconductor and it is no surprise because uh, China is heavily investing in Semiconductor industry to gain independence. And uh, this Chinese uh, semiconductor know-how is really behind the world, right? And some people were estimating probably 10 years behind. Um, in a lot of areas, China is not on top, 
Okay, probably testing they have some chance, but uh, in terms of the critical parts of the of the supply chain, right, the semiconductor value chain or supply chain, uh, China is not on top. Okay, so in terms of fabrication, right, TSMC, Samsung are the best well known ones uh, to make the very very top end and the very very small kind of uh, semiconductor chips. Only they can do it, right? Probably about three nanometers. That's what they're going next. Okay, while China probably is at seven nanometers, right? So in terms of even the size, um, China is not that. And in terms of equipment makers, ASML, which is the Dutch company, applied materials, LAM research from the US, Tokyo Electron is from Japan. These four um, are the top equipment makers for semiconductor industry, right? And ASML is of course the uh, leader in the lithography machines and there's even a backlog. You want to order one machine, it's like two, three years. Uh, you have to wait and it costs more than a jet engine, okay? more than a jet airplane. That's how expensive it is. Okay? And uh, all this technology, the West or uh, the neighbors of China were better at. Okay? So China have a lot to catch up and the government is really pouring a lot more money into this industry so which means that uh, this industry growth will accelerate in the next few years and why are they so interested in this sector is because due to the huawei ban by us right so a lot of all these uh, suppliers like tsmc couldn't take huawei's project they used to and asml can't sell machines um, uh, for for production of uh, Huawei's chips as well, right? So if let's say the, the case was this, right? So if TSMC uses an ASML kind of machine to uh, make Huawei's chip, okay, both of them will be blacklisted or even banned, okay? So that was how serious it is. And given that the, there's a lot more business besides Huawei, nobody wanted Huawei's business, right? That was how serious it was. And that really highlighted China's weakness. And Huawei was just on a downtrend. They have to sew off their Honor uh, line series of their handphone. And they also pivoted to other uh, products, right? Even creating an EVs, okay? So that caused China to be very alarmed and they wanted to be independent from the West on this uh, semiconductor know-how, production, equipment, everything. Okay, so that is why I think that there is potential, a lot of improvement to come from this area. And there is an ETF that tracks this, and that's CraneShare CICC China 5G and Semiconductor ETF. The ticker is KFVG, and it tracks this index. Um, expense ratio again is on the higher side. So you realize that a lot of more of these thematic ETFs, they are more expensive okay? because they, they are more niche, right? Their fund size is more smaller. And uh, to make up for the cost of listing this ETF and the cost of operating this ETF, they need to charge a higher expense ratio to at least uh, break even or make a small profit out of it. Holding is small, 30, okay? So the top 10 is about 50% of the portfolio, right? So you see a lot of all these uh, semiconductor related companies some are manu uh, some are fabrication companies uh, some are assemblers some are uh, more downstream right so it depends on uh, where this uh, supply chain where they lie on right but the index will track all of them okay so that's the ETF to consider if you are interested in investing in the semiconductor uh, growth in China last one the last team is this China consumption Right, uh, China is still not rich compared to the rest of the world. Yes, the GDP is very high, but the middle class is not as rich as the middle class in a developed country. Right, uh, in terms of uh, the middle class population, is just eleven percent, and just two percent of them pay income tax. Okay, so it's really, really a very low number, despite China having so many more worker compared to United States, okay? So you can see the disparity over there. And some people will see that, oh, you know, that means that China uh, is not a good place to invest because the people are poor, right? But you can flip it the other way, right? We are talking about potential. That means the lifting up of this middle class or the growing affluence would be able to create more value or more consumption in China and the businesses will make more money. And the stocks that you invest in will also grow in value, and that's how you get rewarded as well, right? So I do see more positively that the China consumption potential is immense. Okay? If we look at the wealth tier, this was uh, uh, compiled by Goldman Sachs. The wealth tier is 1.4 million, 
very very small right these are the people with 500,000 annual income and middle class is just 146 million so this is the 11 percent that we're talking about just now and they are only making 11,000 uh, USD a year it isn't a very big sum of money compared to developed countries right not even Singapore okay and the blue collar is 236 million that's about 20 percent and that's just 6,000 USD per year and don't forget about the rural workers which are the majority of the working force in China uh, probably more in agriculture and just 2,000 USD a year so a lot has to be lifted up at least to the middle class and 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 then the annual income has to go up even more Otherwise, the consumption uh, in China is not going to be as good as a lot of the other developed countries. And this is by McKinsey. Right? So they expect there's a lift okay, by about 2030, which is just in eight years' time, 60% of the urban consumption is going to be driven by upper middle class right? So they, uh, or the upper middle income in this aspect. So they are expecting a jump from the current 35%, almost double, right? Almost double from where it is uh, today, okay? So that is a good sign, right? And that means that the rise of affluence is going to come. Uh, the consultants, the, the investment bankers have seen this potential and uh, China may not need to rely on export so much, right? Because they've been the factory of the world, they've been making or uh, all these products to sell all over the world, right? It is now time for them to enjoy their wealth, see their income growth, and consume their own products that have been producing for the others. Okay, so there is a rise of affluence that we are talking about. And there's an ETF to track it, which is the Global X China Consumer Brand ETF. It is listed in Hong Kong. It tracks the index selective China Consumer Brand Index. Expense ratio, again, on the higher side, Fund size about 573 million on the smaller end, and number of holdings is uh, 30. Okay, and the top 10 holdings are here, right? Some of the names you might find it familiar, like Mao Tai is a very famous Baijiu brand. Uh, BYD, this uh, company that uh, Warren Buffett is invested in for quite a while, and uh, uh, I leaning this is like the Nike in China, and then the Yum China runs the KFCs. Uh, and other Taco Bells and other brand restaurant in China, right? And Neo is uh, EV uh, that is uh, making headlines as well, right? So you can see that these uh, are ma mainly consumer brands, okay? And these are meant for consumption. And with the rising affluence in China, um, it is likely that these big brands will continue to capture more market, uh, be able to sell to more people and make more money in the process, right? So this is the ETF to track the rising affluence of China consumption. So in summary, I've given you eight ETFs to consider. Uh, that is the 2022 edition, right? And uh, eight is a very auspicious number in uh, Chinese China, uh, in Chinese culture, right? So uh, it just end up like that, okay? It's not deliberate. And the best China ETF is actually the MSCI e uh, China. Uh, you can buy either the one in listed in US or the one listed in Hong Kong. I would prefer the one in Hong Kong. Okay, but just that some of you might be just feel more uh, uh, comfortable investing in the US version, then so be it, right? Just pay a high expense ratio in that aspect. And the best China ETFs, the most famous one will be this, the iShares Hang Seng Tech ETF. It tracks the most uh, popular and the biggest tech companies in China. But if you're more advan uh, adventurous and you really want to invest in a more venture capitalist style, then Chinex and the star market would be the ETFs to consider if uh, uh, you like these fast-growing young companies, right? Full of potential. Okay, so these are the ones to consider. And lastly, I give you three themes because of uh, the government policy in China. And first of it, first of all, is the China, uh, clean energy, and uh, this is listed in Hong Kong. Second one is semiconductor listed in US. And then the third one is the consumer brand ETF to tap on the rising affluence. This is listed in Hong Kong. So these are the ETFs, eight ETFs that you can look at, have fun and uh, analyzing them, but don't need to go too deep because the point is not to buy the individual stocks, but to buy the ETFs and make your uh, big uh, macro bets on certain teams or certain sectors or, or just buy the entire China, which is the MSCI China whichever works for you. Um, of course, look at your own portfolio, how you want to structure it. 
right so i hope this video has been helpful for you remember to like this video and most importantly subscribe to this channel you will get more dedicated china investment updates from here i'm melvin the ceo of dr wealth i hope to see you around goodbye